So we are going to talk today about having your users not want to murder you. Uh, and I have changed the subtitle slightly. We are talking, talking specifically about engineering software psychology. So first, laziness. Laziness is the willingness to put in ridiculous amounts of work now to not have to do work later. So that, that will be my criterion for being lazy. So psycho psychological engineering. Psychological engineering is, is not the kind that you're seeing on, on the right-hand side there. We're talking about the kind, it's not how to get things done. It's not, you know, we're going to use SVN. We're going to use this particular, this particular package. We're going to use this particular platform. It's about, I want to make sure that I did stuff so that things are not going to break. I want to have the user say, Oh, I love this software so much. It's, I'm so happy with this. It's fantastic. I totally trust it. That's the kind of engineering we're, we're doing here. This is engineering that says, yes, I don't have to worry about, OK, I'm going to drive over this bridge, and it's going to fall down. And first question people always ask me about this, well, well isn't this all that user experience stuff? Well, it's kind of the user experience stuff. But what we're really doing here is not saying, OK, we're going to put together, you know, this is this particular user who wants to use the system this way and to do this stuff. We're specifically going to have tools and things we're going to think about to say, this is the way we're going to approach the problem. This is the way we're going to look at what's happening so that we communicate the information that the user needs to have. Uh, this is a very soft approach to programming as opposed to a nuts and bolts we'll use this tool approach. We're going to say what our criteria are are not do our tests pass, but do our users have warm fuzzies about the software or do they have cold pricklies? We want to give them cues which are implicit communication and messages which are explicit communication about the software to make them have those warm fuzzies. We are going to try to manage their expectations of what the software will do, won't do, can do, can't do. Everybody, everybody's seen this one before. Unix is very user friendly. It's just very selective about who its friends are. So we're going to try to not do that. We want to have our software be friendly enough that people can say, OK, yeah, fine, I can trust this. If I, Type in this thing, it's going to tell me, you did something wrong, here's what's wrong, not, oh, your files are gone now, have a nice day. Good programming is not exactly equivalent to good soft science engineering. You can be a fantastic programmer, do a great job. Engineers tend to build stuff that's really safe for engineers. Hey, you know, if you know how it works, it's perfectly safe. You know, there's no problem with the, with the dash RF stuff. You just don't do it in root. So what we are trying to do here is balancing being useful for experts and safe for people who are not experts at all. An example, the iPhone is pretty much safe to use. You, know, you tap on things, it's pretty hard to break stuff. There is an option to erase the entire contents of the iPhone. You have to drill down into settings, pick a specific thing in settings, hit the big red button that says erase everything, go through two separate prompts that say, you're going to erase everything. Seriously, do you really want to do this? I mean, really seriously, do you want to do this? And then it will do the bad thing and erase all of your stuff. This is an example of good software psychology. We're going to do a case study today on www.mechanize and a failure of software psychology. I would first like to say that www.mechanize is one of my favorite things in the entire world. It got me a job. It kept me a job. I love it to death. The people who wrote it are very, very smart people. But what we're going to talk about is one tiny failure in thinking that led to a series of 
problems in the real world for, for users. So everybody in the world has seen this. You create a mech object, you get some URL, and you check success, and you know that's very standard kind of stuff. It's very pearlish. Ask, try to do something, see if it worked. This was the way it worked forever and forever up until 1.4901. And at that point, there was a change. The change was, as noted in the change log, and as an aside, users never read the change logs. Ever, ever, ever do they read the change logs. So, but in the change log, we have this note about things that may break your code. We emphasize may, and we'll notice you've been getting so many new programmers. This was a good thing. We're trying to look at the new people who are coming in and saying, okay, we want to fix things, we want to serve the problem. So they're calling get, and then they never check the, check the results, so say, oh well, you know, this is a problem. So we're putting on the seat belts for them. Okay, what are the seat belts? Well, the seat belts are, and this is translating it into the actual reality as opposed to the text it was, these are the things that are completely going to break your code that was working perfectly fine for no obvious reason. And what's going to happen is when you do a get request, if it fails, the code will die. OK. Engineering decision. So that means that this canonical example, the one that's documented everywhere, the one that's in spidering hacks, the one that's in Perl cookbook, this example is going to die. That is a psychological engineering problem because all of a sudden this code you've been running for months doesn't work except when it does continue to work because if you've subclassed www mechanize then the auto check uh, uh, code is, is skipped so it works the way it used to work before this is an inconsistency. Inconsistencies are always bad because inconsistencies mean cold pricklies. Cold pricklies we don't want. We want to find a different way to do this. The error message is this. Error getting some URL and whatever the reason was. Timeout, 404, whatever. Which is a fantastically correct message. It's technically accurate. You did a get request. It timed out. What it is, is psychologically incomplete. We don't know why this suddenly happened. It never happened before. Why am I suddenly getting this message now? Why is my code broken? What happened to my code? So this is the classic sudden surprise result. We don't ever want a sudden surprise result. Working code in production is now broken code. Um, it's also only broken in an exceptional situation. If the get fails, then the code fails. So you've got a situation where you're saying, OK, well, hey, I have this quick diagnostic. I need to run to see and make sure everything's working. I'll get this URL. That should happen, and this should happen, and this should happen, and this should happen. So you get the first one, you get the second one where there's a problem. And instead of getting the message saying, OK, well, second thing didn't happen. We need to check three, four, and five. It dies on two, and OK, it's 2 AM. My code is dying. Where's the damn sysadmin? So this can often happen in a situation where you have person A who writes a bunch of scripts and just wants to get stuff done, and person B who's the one who has to maintain the machine. So OK, I'm going to install the new version of www.mechanize because i got this bug I need to fix. And three weeks later, somebody else calls you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and says, my script that checks to see why production is having a problem is breaking. What did you do? We never want to have that happen. But you know, this has got to be, well, maybe we just didn't get the message out. Um, does anybody remember this one with the iPhone 4? Uh, this, is, this is a classic misstep in the other direction by a company that doesn't often do this. 
which is to say, well, you know, you, you've been doing something the way you've always been doing it before. You've been holding your phone to your ear. Well, now you hold your phone to the ear just exactly the way you did before. And now your phone doesn't work. Well, you're holding the phone wrong. This is the wrong answer. <laughs> the answer ended up actually being the free case program, if anybody remembers that, where Apple had to give everybody a free case because of the antenna problem. So everything was great with, going back to WWW back and eyes, everything was great as long as everything was working fine, you did a get, you got a successful result, fantastic, everything's good. And then when the get failed, you had this problem, which is all of a sudden your code was broken. But surely this is, you know, this was really straightened out, no problem, right? Okay, well, um, the date here is April 19th, 2012. This is four years after the release. And why is it that my gut doesn't work? It dies. And again, on Stack Overflow, same problem. This is fortunately the, la the latest one I could find. That was June 4th, 2012. But that's still four years. And that is the big question. Why did it take four years to get this message out? It doesn't seem all that complicated. Um, it doesn't make any sense to a programmer. I put it in the documentation. What's the problem? The WWW Mechanized Cookbook had this in day one. You should use auto check zero if you want to use next success. The other question is, why did this happen at all? Why did we ever get into the situation where this, this happened? Why didn't we get the message across? And why did it take so long for people to actually get this message? Well, part one was indeed caused by success. WW Mechanized was so incredibly awesome. You just used it, it worked, it was fantastic. It was so good, you used it for everything. And of course, that meant that it was all over the place in lots of scripts, some that got ran all the time, some that got ran, you know, every once in a while when something went wrong every three, four, five, six months. And so not a problem, you know, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just do our stuff and it gets updated and wait a minute, the script broke. And then a month and a half later, this other script is broken. And then another three months later, this script is broken. So again, too much complacency, too much awesome. We just figured, hey, it's always gonna work. When we had a previous majorish change to Mac, it was saying, take things that you should have been doing before and make them mandatory. You have to do them now. It was saying, take deprecated features that have already been deprecated and take them away. Now notice that we are saying, making things that you should have been doing already mandatory. We have this window of deprecation. The change, again, this is quoting from the change log. It's saying, this seems like a good place to go to 1.0. This is an important psychological barrier, going from 0. something to 1. something. You're saying, I have done something big. I have gone from version X to version Y. That means something big must have changed. I should pay more attention. This is a expectation management. The other thing was is that the way this particular change was done, they removed a variable. And if you tried to just go ahead and use that and you had use strict on, then use strict would cause you to fail at compile time. So you got a much earlier warning saying, hey, you have a potential problem with your script, rather than, okay, it's been running for two and a half hours and you get failed and, oh, well, so much for that. This is, in the case of the use strict thing, an applied use of cold bricklays. You want to have that, start the script, and all of a sudden the script just dies. You want to look at it right now rather than, okay, well, it'll run it, you'll run it at midnight, and I'll see what happened in the morning. 
Complacency part two, out of date documentation. Not the www mechanized docs, but every other printed documentation in the world was saying, oh, you need to do it with, uh, with just this mech success. That's perfectly fine. The cookbook had it day one. That was the right, the right thing. But all the books didn't have it. So if you went to the Pearl Cookbook and said, well, what's the right way to do this? The Pearl Cookbook said, you need to use mech success because that'll work. And uh, unfortunately, WWW Mechanize Examples still doesn't have auto check one on all of its examples. In fact, only two out of the 10 examples use auto check one. All the other ones don't. So again, if you're just scanning through and say, oh, here's a sample program, I'll use that. You won't get the, I should be using auto check. Google results are out of date. Here's, a, here's an example of Google on looking for mech success. All of these guys, except for the mechanized PM one, don't mention that you need to turn auto check off. If you do a, a search for www mechanized example and take out Ruby because there are crap loads of Ruby examples, there are 176,000 hits. Most of them still don't need to turn off auto check and they use mech success. So we have crap loads of bad examples of, of how to do things wrong. So summarizing the psychological failures, we had no lead up to the change in the code. We went from 148 where we didn't have auto check at all to 149 which was like, okay, auto check's on, have a good time with it. We didn't have any meta messaging that's saying, you need to be aware that there's a problem here that's different from what happened when you were running your code yesterday. We didn't have any way to easily map from, I got this thing that said the get failed. Well, what am I supposed to do now? We didn't have a case where the common sense use case was the one that was most likely to be broken, the one that was the most commonly seen in documentation, the one that was a canonical example, was the one that was most likely to be broken. So this is essentially how everybody felt when, when that turned around, at least where I was working, which was Yahoo. When we put out 149.01, essentially this is what happened. The phone rang off the hook, everybody's scripts were broken. What's going on? Why did you break Perl? And so on. So that was pretty much how everybody <laughs> felt about the process. So the importance is we've got to figure out a way to communicate. This is the primary job of psychological engineering is figuring out how to get the message across that you need to get across. Everybody has to get the message. Most of the other sources are saying, no, 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 this is the right way to do it. But you've made a change. How do you make that work? How do you make this happen so that you don't have this miscommunication? You've got to get that out to a whole bunch of people. How do you make that happen? Let's not skip tool number one. That's really important. Incrementing the major version is tool number one. If you have a big change, that you can't go through a deprecation cycle for. You have to do it now. It makes a major change to the way the API works. You've got to bump the major version. This is, this is that meta signal that says something important has happened in the hindbrain of all the people who are using your module. It says, oh wait, 1.0 to 2.0, that's probably, that's probably significant. Maybe I should go read the documentation this time. <laughs> Number two, accurately and completely diagnose failures so that you have that psychological completion of this happened, this is what's wrong, this is what to do. So this is a rewrite of the, of the error message. So it's error getting such and such, page not found, and then you didn't specify auto check and new. 
you should use auto check one if you want to check status yourself. Or if I got that backwards. Anyway, again, a messaging problem. But the idea is to make sure that you have said, this is what you want to do to fix your problem. Number three, add a warning. It says, you have done something that could conceivably bite you. I'm going to tell you about it now, assuming that you probably know what you're doing. So here we go. I've done a www mechanized new without setting auto check either to one or zero. It says, you have a non subclass www mechanize object. We are now defaulting that to auto check one. And that should be enough for somebody to say, what auto check, what does auto check one mean? And at least go look at the documentation. So this is, this is a case of giving somebody the cold pricklies for a good reason. Number four, add an inconvenient hack that lets the old code continue to work. So here's an example. You have a, a new environment variable that says, I am ignoring the auto check requirement. If that's set to true, then mechanize new continues to work the old way as if auto check never existed at all. So the code that was working continues to work. And we make it a long and complicated variable name so that it is so much of a pain in the ass that people don't say, well, this is the way I'll fix all my production scripts. They'll actually go back and fix them. And of course, we also give them a warning saying, hey, by the way, we overrode auto check one. So they'll get another meta message, a little poke, another little cold prickly. Maybe I'm not doing the right thing to say, I should fix this sometime. And number five, and this is a good thing to do, but again, it's number five on the list because it actually doesn't work as well as the other ones, which is to put in very obvious documentation. It was right to put the change in the change log, but it should have been in big block letters in the Perl doc at the top to say, there has been an important API change. Prior to anything in the usage section. Make sure it, it is absolutely clear. Use the code properly in the synopsis. There has been a change. This is it. You need to do this. So let's do a quick analysis of mechanize and say, so what was the source of failure here? How did this happen? Why didn't all of these good ideas get implemented in the 14901 change. And the first one is probably perspective. From the standpoint of view of the maintainers of WW Mechanize, the problem was not anything else other than lots of people are writing to me and saying, WW Mechanize doesn't work because I did a get and I didn't get any page and I don't know what's wrong. So the perspective was, I need to solve this problem that I have, which is a mailbox full of stuff that is, to me, irrelevant. So I'll make a fix so I don't get those emails anymore. So making the fix to get, not get the emails fixed that problem, but it caused a whole different other set of problems. Unintended consequences. This particular graphic is a picture of erosion caused by rabbits in Australia. Um, when they brought in rabbits, who knew that this is what rabbits would cause? Indirectly, but so we were looking for um, a way to solve that problem of, I have a problem that I can't get my work done because I'm continuously answering emails to people saying, put in you know, mech success to make sure that you get worked. Because that fixed that problem, it was good. But because it broke existing old code without a clear path to, this is how I fix my old code, we had an unintended consequence. So let's talk a little bit about the basis for psychological engineering. 
have to properly prepare the uh, audience that you want to talk to. You have to be able to say, this is what I'm going to be doing. This is what's going to be happening. You have to deploy it in a way that allows the change to work its way in and not cause any problems in the process. You need to provide diagnosis to your users when the problem occurs to be able to say, this is how it went wrong, this is what you need to do, this is how you need to fix it. And last, you have to give them a last ditch rescue operation. If your code can't be changed because it's in production and you really, really, really need to get it fixed, you can do this. So what we're trying to do is both protect the people that we're writing the software for and communicate to them at the same time that something is about to happen, it's a change, you're going to need to make changes, but I'm giving you all this information. I'm letting you know I want you to be able to feel like you can trust me. So preparing. When you're about to make a change, you need to blog about it. You need to email your users and say, hey, by the way, we're going to make this change. This is how it works. This is how it all works out. This is what you have to do to work with the new, with the new code so that everything that you have now continues to work. Put it out on Twitter. Put it out on mailing lists. Put it out on Perlmux. Any other website you can think of that your users are going to read. You just need to make sure that everybody sees it. And do it more than once because if you do it only once, people will just say, oh yeah, whatever, and skip it. When it comes to deployment, you have to have it in the change log, in your man pages, in your check-in comments, and most importantly, in your error messages. Uh, having your error messages say, this problem was caused by this change, do this to fix it, is very, very, very important. One other item, if you can possibly have a deprecation cycle, do it. If you can say, okay, in the release after this one, we're going to change over from having this situation where you have to use mech success to check your gets to us dying if your get fails. And we'll warn you in this release, and then the next release is going to take, take effect. Diagnosis, you have to show the error as early as you possibly can. If you can do it at compile time, do it at compile time. If you can't do it there, then try to do it when the object is created. If you can't do it there, then be as exact as you possibly can be when an error actually occurs. And last, give them a way out. If there's a situation where they just absolutely can't change their code, give them an, give them an, an example like this. I'm ignoring the Mac auto check requirement. It's a way for them to be able to get past Okay, look, I need to fix this tomorrow, but right now I need to get the script to run. So basically what we're saying is make the situation obvious. You have to know what it is. You have to know how to fix it in the short term. You need to know how to fix it in the long term. And you need to know what the fallback is if there is possible to have one. This is all more work for you. but. Since you're lazy, you're perfectly willing to put in this work now so you don't have to do work later at 3 o'clock in the morning. So I wrote a um, post on Perlmonks about this. And realistically speaking, most people actually didn't agree with me. Um, it, was, it, was really, it was really quite fascinating. I, I, you know, I, I put this out, and there were people were saying, Oh, you're coddling your users. And that is a that is a classic, I'm just a software developer, you know, this this psychological stuff is 
the psychological stuff is very important. Coddling is a good thing to do, particularly in the situation that we're in here. We've got dub 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 mechanized, which is widely used. I mean, it's one of the th one of the things that a lot of people know, even if they don't know anything else about Perl, they know about dub 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 mechanized. Uh, it's one of the really good things. It's one of the things that people say, yeah. That's a great module. I just used it, and it worked. It was fantastic, and it made me feel good about Perl. And there's a new version of Mechanized. Well, let's install that, and that goes by, and you never see it. And the classic case is sometimes maybe you're just not very smart, and that is. That includes me being not very smart, because when it's this time, I am not very smart. I'm running at maybe about 60%. And I want to code so the 60% me at 2 o'clock in the morning can look at the code and say, oh, right, it's obvious what the problem is here. Not be, OK, what was it? What did I do? Where's some coffee? It's 3.30. People are calling me on the phone saying, why is the site not up? OK, I don't want that to be the case. I want it to just be, oh, fine. I know what the problem is here. So here's an example. So when people say, well, pff, come on, that's not, that's, you know, just, just suck it up. You're tired. Here's an example from a, a flight safety problem. Uh, the flight officer fell asleep. He was asleep for longer than the uh, mandated time. The mandated time for a, a flight officer on an airplane to take a nap is about 20 minutes. Because you can wake back up from that and be fairly refreshed. He fell asleep for 75 minutes. He woke up. He was disoriented. He wasn't feeling very well. He mistook the planet Venus for another f aircraft. And then when he realized, no, wait, that's not the other aircraft. This is the other aircraft because its lights are blinking. He thought it was above them, so he put the plane into a dive. Four people got injured. This is not because he was incompetent. It was because he was tired. You need to budget for not only your users, but yourself. This is psychological engineering for yourself. So let's talk a little bit about usability. So when an error occurs, there are several things you can do. Nothing. The error just happens, and your program happily chugs on. And later on, when all the bits start falling from the ceiling, you realize, OK, well, gee, there was a problem. Or you can say, you got an error. Died at line 45. Not particularly useful, or if you had the line number at all. Uh, you could say, you got this error. Error getting such and such. Timeout. OK, it's still not really useful. This is usable. You got this error. Here's why you got this error. Here's what you do to fix this error. This requires you to do more work. But it's worth doing. It's worth doing for the user who's using your module for the first time and suddenly gets this warm, fuzzy feeling when the error occurs. It's, it's OK. The programmer cared. The programmer wanted me to know what was going on. It's for you at 2 o'clock in the morning when you're tired and muzzy and fuzzy and you can't remember exactly how this thing works. But your error message tells you how you have to rescue yourself. So the goal of psychological engineering is trust me. Make believe in my code. Believe in what I'm doing. Believe that I am a good programmer. I am communicating to you and giving you all I can about the situation, about the error, about how the code works, so that you can feel, yes, this is good code. This is code I can put in my production code. This is code I can trust. Now, I have gone a little short because I wanted to have enough time for people to talk about this and, and think about ideas. So let's, let's take a little 
stop here and questions. Yes. That's a great, a great idea. If, uh, say, if the success object caused a runtime, or excuse me, a compile time error instead of a well, runtime? It could, couldn't cause a compile time error because the method calls are late now, but it could at least cause a runtime error or warning. Right, but if we, didn't, if we didn't get to it because auto check had already caused the get to fall over, we wouldn't have, we ha wouldn't have gotten there. But the idea, the idea is sound. Find as many possible ways to inform the user Say if they ran it with with uh, with the the I am ignoring the auto check requirement variable on it. Success should say, by the way, I, I'm only working because auto check has been turned off by the global variable. Yes. That is an excellent question. And that is one of the hard things about, soft, about software psychology engineering. You have to start thinking about that early on. So when you say, OK, when an error occurs, what am I first, what was it? And then why did it happen? And that's not just the why did the error happen? It's, why did I not spot why it happened? You ha and th this, is, this, is, um, this requires everybody to be very egoless about their programming. You have to say, OK, it's all right that there was a problem. What we're focused on is fixing the problem, not saying, dude, you really screwed up here. It's, OK, we had a problem. We need to fix that problem. What's the right way to fix that problem so we don't have it again? Yes? Exactly so. Um, at White Hat, in particular, I have, and this is, this is, this is the first place I've worked at that, that we really do a good job of this. Um, if something screws up, the team says, we made a mistake. It's not, you know, whoever it was who wrote that particular section of code. Even if it was, you know, this one person who made a particular mistake. It's like, we screwed this up. So how do we keep this from happening the next time so that there isn't going to be a problem the next time? Yes? That is an excellent idea, and if you've got a if you've got a cross section of folks from from very sophisticated to very unsophisticated, that is the very best you can you can do. Yes. How do you respond to uh, programmers or even managers that say, "No, don't put a detailed message in there. We don't want to show that to the customers." Hmm. <laughs> Maybe not a <coughs> It's a good it's a good question. Um, it's a good question. I think that the, the right response to that is to say, OK, that's good. We won't show it to the customer, but we have to log it. We have to log it in detail so that if the prob problem occurs and we know which customer it was, which transaction it was, what time it was, so that when they call us up and say, we got the, the you need to call White Hat because this is broken error, we actually know what one it was. I saw another hand here somewhere. Yes, no? Yes? Well, one of the things that's intriguing up is the idea of mature deployment cycles and mature um, development cycles. Right. And the big problem we have with open source is that we just don't want to take the time to do it. We've got this cool thing, we want to deliver it now. There's nobody else in my back pocket who can write all this documentation for me. Right. It's and that's go, that's going back to being being lazy in the, in the in the Perl way, which is saying yes, I know that it would be so much easier for me to just go ahead and release this with this really cool feature, but I'm going to be lazy and I'm going to write the documentation, 
and I'm going to write the deprecation cycle stuff, and I'm going to write that little bit of code that requires me to keep the old way and the new way for this release, and then I can get rid of it. Uh, it's it's a discipline, a personal discipline thing. Yes. Yes, yes. You, 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 and the the way that we found that to to work that better is to shorten the development cycle. Say, okay, we're going to do a little thing. We're going to do that little thing right. Then we're going to do the next little thing, and we're going to do that next little thing right. And building those. Yes. Right. Um, because when you choose a new class name, it well, that is a that's a very good question. Hang on a second. Yes. Again, that is also an, another good idea. The principal thing that um, I'm thinking of from a, another another psychological engineering thing is minimizing change. If you can say, okay, you can take module A and take module A prime and put it in place, and it works just exactly the same as it did the last time. We've added this new feature, but it won't hurt you. That's good. Um, if it's such a big feature that you feel like, OK, this is going to endanger all the code that I can think of that people have done, then absolutely the right answer is to say, look, this is um, www mechanized pro to add on this particular new feature. Other questions, other discussion? Yes? Just a general comment. I mean, if you have good test scripts and you make a change, and you have to then modify your test script for basic functionality to work, then you may want to question that change. Mm -hmm. That, that, is a, that is an excellent criterion, because your test scripts are sort of like those one-offs that everybody's going to write and say, oh, God, I just, I just got to get this done, I'll, I'll, and I'll, I'll file it in my, in my back pocket. So if you have to do a huge change like that, you can say, that's, that's giving yourself the cold prickles. Uh, yes? Mm -hmm. And it, it changed one of the parameters for authentication, and it sprayed out this multi-line message that was really large. But what it actually ended up doing is uh, outputting in like the middle of HTTP headers or JSON output. Oh dear. Things that nobody would ever see except for another piece of software that didn't understand what to do with it. So it ended up breaking like web interfaces and just all sorts of things where users were just completely clueless as to what happened. Now, it was pretty obvious once somebody actually went and inspected it, but you needed somebody who knew what they were doing. Yes, indeed, and uh, that is that is an excellent example of something else that was not psychologically engineered properly. I can't, off the top of my head, come up with a good solution for it. I, I but you're absolutely right. That's exactly the same kind of breakage. Um, possibly dumping it to standard error instead of to standard out, but. Um, or, again, with a, with a deprecation cycle saying, we're going to change the way we handle our error reporting for this particular module, which is to do this in the next release. So we've implemented that in this release, and you can use that by saying new messaging equal one when you're creating the object. Uh, I think I saw another hand or two over there. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely, and the um, and it also means that the uh, the DevOps team and Dev have to be working very closely together. In fact, there should be a DevOps team, if that makes any sense. If there isn't one, then there should be at least somebody who says, "Okay, look, we need to get together with the guys who are maintaining the machine and the guys who are running code on the machine, and make sure that we're you know 
I'm not going to bump heads. Even if it's not a formal, there's a group that handles this. At least there's some, pl some point where people talk to each other and say, oh, yeah, I'm going to upgrade this module next week. And the other person says, well, is there anything that's going to change? And I say, oh, yeah, this new auto check thing. But you don't need to worry about that. Ah. Yes? It seems to me like, like this is primarily focused for code which is intended to be used for, by, by other programmers as opposed to things which are designed for end users. Mm -hmm. Um, it, I think I think that it's actually very applicable uh, uh, from from the same point of view of the the way I was coming at it was the the standpoint of okay when you're designing your software even if it's software just for you know the guy who's on the other end of the web browser when something goes wrong um, you need to you know bar, barring management uh, you need to actually tell him what happened and what to do if there's something that he can do. And if there's nothing he can do, at least you can tell him, this went wrong. It's our fault. Sorry, we'll fix it. Um, if it's a situation where there's something that he, he or she can actually do, then it should be, OK, you, know, you entered you know, this particular thing on this form. Let's back you up. And you can fill in this particular thing that was missing. And yes, by the way, we did keep all your other data, and you won't have to enter it again. Again, that's more psychological engineering saying, I'm not going to make you do all this work over again. And I'm out of time. And thank you guys very much. Great time.